Good afternoon. I'm Daniel Reich uh, from NINDS, and it's my honor to introduce today's WALS speaker. Um, this talk is jointly organized with the Inflammatory Diseases Interest Group, and so if you'll indulge me for just a minute, I want to tell you about that. Um, this group was established in 2015 following the intramural program's uh, long-term planning process to try to bring together uh, the um, uh, large number of, of labs on campus that study inflammation as sort of a unifying uh, theme in, in disease. Um, it currently is, uh, has support from seven ICs as well as uh, the deputy director for intramural research. Uh, mostly it's a, a speaker series. Um, it has a steering committee uh, from multiple ICs, uh, and there's a listserv. So if any of you want uh, uh, information about the talks that are being organized, um, please sign up on the list.nah.gov uh, website. This is our lineup for the rest of the 2017-2018 um, uh, season. We have um, a lot of great speakers, as you can see, both uh, from NIH and uh, from uh, around the country, and as you'll see today, from around the world as well. And we've already started planning next year's, um, uh, next year's season as well. Um, just a reminder that uh, this is the middle talk of, of three somewhat related, um, kind of fortuitous uh, uh, talks today, Aviv Regev's uh, talk, um, Michal Schwartz's talk, and then there'll be uh, the IIG seminar uh, at 4.15 in Lipset, um, Dan Kua is speaking there, and um, uh, as well, right after this talk, there'll be a reception in the library. Uh, so, um, on to Professor Schwartz, Michal Schwartz, um, who studied chemistry at the Hebrew University uh, of Jerusalem and then went on to do her graduate studies under uh, Michael Sella and Edna Moses at the Weizmann Institute. After a postdoc uh, at the University of Michigan, she returned to Weizmann, um, where she's been since 1987, the Maurice and Ilsa Katz Professor of Neuroimmunology. Over the years, she's won numerous awards for her work in ophthalmology, uh, spinal cord injury, neuroscience, neuroimmunology, including the 2015 Blumberg Prize for Excellence in Medical Research and the 2017 Rappaport Prize for Excellence in Biomedical Research. She is currently the president of the International Society of Neuroimmunology, and her own scientific journey and ideas are summarized in her 2016 book, Neuroimmunity. Um, Professor Schwartz is one of those people who looks at things differently from the way other people do, and of course that's the best way to do science. Her work has long been focused on the interface between the brain and the immune system, as well as normal aging, and that work has really shifted the paradigm uh, in this space. In a series of groundbreaking studies, she and her team showed that both the adaptive and the innate arms uh, of the immune system can contribute not only to disease pathogenesis, but also, uh, crucially, to repair and plasticity, a concept that she has called protective autoimmunity. As part of this work, she recently demonstrated that the gateway for the peripheral immune system to interact with the brain is not the meninges, as commonly thought, but rather the wispy choroid plexus deep within the ventricular system of the brain, and that dysfunction of this gateway plays a major role in Alzheimer's disease. And it's this work uh, that is the topic of her talk today, Systemic Immunity Protects the Mind, Can Immune Checkpoint Blockade Combat Alzheimer's Disease? So welcome, Professor Schwartz. What is it like this picture? This is for lady gloves, right? Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I have a tendency to speak fast. And since I'm jet lag, I may even speak faster. So what I'm going to do for you, I'll summarize uh, very briefly 20 years of working, which we call a paradigm shift, and then devote a big part of my talk to the issue of how harnessing the immune system by immune checkpoint blockade can uh, combat Alzheimer's disease. So my laboratory has been focused for the last 20 years on trying to decipher the relationship between the brain and the immune system. Uh, and this was summarized, where is the pointer? The pointer? Oh. Uh, the, 
So uh, this was summarized lately in an article which we asked can uh, neurotherapy treat neurodegenerative diseases with the premise that transient uh, boosting adaptive immunity can fight against Alzheimer's. So we know that uh, almost all neurodegenerative condition, whether there is acute injury, brain or spinal cord, or chronic neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer, Parkinson, ALS, any depression or just aging or age-related dementia, there is a local inflammation. For decades, it was believed that it's very much similar to the inflammation that we see in multiple sclerosis and therefore attempt have been made to fight against this local neuroinflammation with anti-inflammatory drug. In 2008, there was a very huge, huge clinical trial using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug uh, in Alzheimer's, which has completely failed, and the question was, what have, been, have we missed? According to our understanding, the brain is not an autonomous tissue. We understand that neurodegenerative disease involve not only the brain, but also this function of the systemic immune system. And we have to be carefully distinguished between neuroinflammation associated with neurodegenerative disease and neuroinflammation associated with autoimmune disease. So we know that the immune patrol all tissue body as, and the major role is to rec recognize and destroy microorganisms before they invade the tissue, destroy malignancy be before they transform to cells. And it was believed for decades that the, immune si the brain escaped from this immune surveillance. This was based mainly by, because of the view that the brain is encapsulated in blood-brain barrier and every capillary within the brain is covered by the blood-brain barrier, which is basically endothelial barrier. However, we have between the brain and the circulation, we have two additional type of barrier, which I'm going to focus a lot on it. One of which is the meningeal barrier, and the other one is the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier. So definitely the blood-brain barrier should be sealed under all circumstances. The meningeal barrier, again, is endothelial barrier, the bar I mean, I'm referring to the uh, pia barrier, which is endothelial barrier. The only barrier between the brain and the circulation, which is not endothelial barrier, is the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier, in which the blood and endothelial cells are fenestrated, and the barrier is formed by tightly connection, connected epithelial cells. It was long believed that this barrier, is, which is true, is the place where the CSF is being formed, but it was not considered as permissive site for brain immune uh, dialogue. Now we know all also that within the brain, there are resident cells, the myeloid cells, the microglia. For years, if you open any textbook or any paper for um, 10 or even five years ago, you would see micro, if there is an inflammation, microglia slash infiltrating macrophages. We know now that the microglia are of distinct origin. The microglia are not identical to macrophages. Microglia are the only resident myeloid cells in the brain. The renewal is by slow proliferation. Macrophages don't replace microglia. But it's very important to note that microglia are the brain phagocytic cells. Nevertheless, they are under tight control to ensure that they will do phagocytic, cell, uh, phagocytic activity without endangering any neighboring cells. And therefore, they are controlled by the milieu of the CNS, which is uh, enriched with TGF beta. And there is also very tight cell-cell interaction. The microglia express the fractal kind receptor, and they are med which are are uh, very much suppressed by the fractal kind ligand, which is expressed by neuron. There is also CD200. So overall, microglia are t under tight control, which ensure activity, but under very strict regulation. 
So specifically, what was believed for many years that the brain does not require circulating immune cells, it relies only on the myeloid cells, the microglia. It was believed that microglia and infiltrating cells are redundant cells, we know now they are not. Uh, immune cells entry to the CNS was believed for decades that is only under pathology and it's bad. We, uh, we will discuss that it's not the situation. Uh, and we know now that entry of immune cells from the circulation does not require breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, which was, was commonly believed. So the landmarks of the work that I'm going to show you today, very briefly the past and mainly to the present. So in 1998 and 1999, we, were, we showed for the first time that T cell and macrophages support repair. Subsequently, we found that T cells support uh, um, normal brain plasticity, although they are excluded from the brain. And since 2013, where we discovered that the black cerebrospinal fluid barrier, mainly the choroid plexus epithelium, support entry of immune cells to the CNS without the need for breaching of the blood-brain barrier. And then we found that in aging and in all neurodegenerative condition, uh, this barrier, this function, and we can overcome this function by immune checkpoint blockade. So briefly, uh, as I said, uh, we, probably, we, we found in 1998 that macrophages support repair. At that time, it was accepted with a lot of skepticism and it was re uh, cited only in the negative way. How come macrophages can support repair if uh, the brain is full of resident microglia? We claim that they are not redundant cells. And subsequently, many other work, including in Alzheimer, have demonstrated that recruitment of blood bone macrophages or monocytes derived macrophages as we're currently calling them are needed to fight against Alzheimer and many other pathology. So commonly now we believe that blood bone macrophages are not redundant cells and are needed to be recruited under pathological condition including Alzheimer. We know now that blood bone macrophages can display inside the brain many activities and just not inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. They can be source of neurotrophic factor, they can be source of metalloproteases degrading enzyme, they can do be anti-inflammatory so they can display numerous activity. Subsequent to the macrophages, we demonstrate in an independent paper that T cell also support brain repair, and specifically T cells that recognize CNS antigen, and we coined the idea of protective autoimmunity. Needless to say that at that time, we didn't know what are the relationship between the T cell, the microglia and macrophages. These were two independent observations. Subsequently, we observed in a model of spinal cord, and I'll just touch it very briefly, we found that the T cell support recruitment of monocytes derived macrophages still within no R, and the major role of uh, monocytes derived macrophages, the site of the injury, is to suppress the microglial response. And monocytes derived from IL-10 deficient mice failed to support repair. So overall, we had an idea that T cell can support recruitment of macrophages and the local macrophages are needed to resolve the inflammation. Subsequently, we found it also, also needed to resolve the scar for tissue. Independent work, at that time, two graduate students were in my lab. Two of them are now a uh, professor, uh, one in Virginia, Jonathan Kipnis, and one at the Weizmann Institute. They were spending with me hours and asking me if T cells are needed to support repair, why we never have full repair, and maybe T cells have much more fundamental role in brain plasticity. And we thought if this is the case, it's very easy to check. We took animal and placed them in an enriched environment, a cage that was developed by Rusty Gage Lab. 
and we place the animal and under this condition you can see increased neurogenesis in the hippocampus. When we place the immune compromised animal in the same cage like skid mice or mice that are deficient in CNS T cell, uh, we found that there is a dramatic reduction in neurogenesis. In other words, we found that the, one of the mechanisms by which neurogenesis is boosted in an rich environment involves T cell. And you can see very nicely here are newly formed neurons in the hippocampus of wild animal and very few in immune compromised animal. We check cognition of these mice and we found the same, that cognitive ability is down-regulated in immune-compromised animal and this was repeated by numerous works thereafter. So overall, we uh, suggested that T-cell support uh, brain plasticity, including neurogenesis, uh, hippocampal activity, and lately it was shown also social behavior and coping with stress. So overall, we were left with key issue. How can leukocyte enter t traffic to the CNS under injurious condition without breaching the blood-brain barrier? So basically, our macrophages can enter to the CNS, and more importantly, how can T cell support healthy brain plasticity if we, they are excluded because we know that there are no T cell in healthy brain parenchyma? So struggling with this question for a while, one of my graduate student, um, outstanding graduate student, she was struggling uh, with it for four years. And finally, she discovered in a model of spinal cord injury that macrophages that support repair can enter either through the leptomeninges, but the ones that are displaying locally anti-inflammatory role are coming, crawling from the remote blood CSF barrier which is in the four ventricles. This came as a big surprise for us because the spinal cord injury is inflicted here and she found that monocytes derived macrophages that locally display anti-inflammatory role are crawling through the blood CSF barrier. So the question was what triggered the activation of the blood, this blood CSF barrier? We went further and we isolated the blood CSF barrier this is the uh, choroid plexus epithelium, and we found that this tissue, uh, even if we extensively perfused the animals, we found T cell outside the blood vessel in the stroma. So we took this T cell and we decided to explore further how it works. We envisioned that maybe under injurious condition, from the parenchyma, the, we know that there is release of IL-6, uh, IL uh, TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta. So we envision that maybe the villi of the epithelial cell says, sense the pro-inflammatory cytokine, and maybe there are T cells that are sitting in this stroma. We isolated this T cell, and we found that 90, almost 97% of these T cells are effector memory CD4 positive T cell which means that they are engaged with their cognate antigen, and indeed we found in the stroma, T cell engage in this, uh, with antigen-presenting cells. We uh, found that this T cell can locally produce interferon gamma, IL-4, and IL-10. We didn't find any encephalitogenic T cell in this stroma. To test our working hypothesis, we further tested what are these T cells are recognizing, and together with Neil Friedman at the Weizmann Institute, we, uh, we decided to sequence the T cell receptor of, the, of those T cells that we isolated from the epithelial, from the choroid plexus, and we found that T cells that sit here, 70% of them are recognizing CNS antigen. In other words, the gatekeeper of the brain, the choroid plexus epithelium is enriched with T cell that recognize CNS antigen. We further culture these epithelial cells to create a monolayer and tested whether indeed there is a the cytokine that this, this epithelial cells are sensing, such as TNF alpha or IL-6 that are upregulated in CSF after injury, are affecting expression of trafficking molecule by the choroid plexus, and trafficking molecules are chemokine and integrin. So we culture the cells and expose them either to TNF-alpha or IL-6 or IL-1-beta, and also to the cytokine that we found that the T-cell here are producing, such as 
interferon gamma R4 or R10. To make a long story short, we found that the only cytokine that comes from the T cell that activate the choroid plexus is interferon gamma. We tested, the referee asked us to test all the encephalitogenic T cells, none of them are activating the choroid plexus epithelium. IL-17, IL-23 didn't activate the choroid, only interferon gamma. And there was a very robust synergy between the TNF alpha and IL interferon gamma to activate the choroid plexus for uh, trafficking molecules, which was very uh, satisfaction, uh, satisfactory for us because that's what we envisioned, that there is a synergy between what the epithelial cells sense when there is an inflammation in the brain and the cytokine that produced by T cell. We found that interferon gamma knockout mice or interferon gamma receptor knockout mice, there is a dramatic reduction in the number of T cell that we found in the CSF, and there is dramatic reduction in trafficking molecule. Uh, we, we tested whether TNF-alpha has a role in activation of the choroid plexus epithelium, and by image stream we found yes, it's indeed uh, very much dependent on NF-kappa B, P65. So overall, the idea is that we found that interferon gamma is a key cytokine that is needed to activate the choroid plexus epithelium for trafficking. So our key question then came out, what does the fate of the, this compartment affect the brain in neurodegenerative diseases? And if so, can we manipulate the choroid plexus and affect the disease? So we started in aging, and then we moved to Alzheimer. So we first tested the choroid plexus with aging, and we found that there is a dramatic reduction in the availability of interferon gamma with aging of the mice. Around 18 months, there is a dramatic drop. We tested whether the choroid plexus in aged animal express any of the cognitive impairing uh, molecule that we found by Tony Weiskuri, such as CXC11, and we found that there is a dramatic increase. We further decided to get more insight whether aging of the brain reflect aging of this choroid plexus epithelium, or aging of the blood, or aging of the tissue. To this end, we collected 11 tissue from young animal and 11 tissue from aged animal, and they did uh, uh, RNA sequencing, robust RNA sequencing. And to our surprise, we found that the aging of the choroid plexus has a very unique signature. There is elevation of interferon beta, which we didn't find in any other aged tissue and we didn't find in young tissue. So there is a robust elevation of interferon beta, type 1 interferon, and down regulation of interferon gamma, which we found before. Interestingly, several months before our science paper, there was another science paper showing inverse relationship between interferon beta and interferon gamma. We got human section from uh, uh, UK, and we asked expli explicitly to get tissue from age population that didn't die out of any neurological disease and we found it in age population, the same signature of the choroid plexus, elevation of signature interferon beta. Together with Tony Weiskuri from Stanford, we decided to explore whether the elevation of interferon beta uh, and the down regulation of interferon gamma is caused by signaling from the brain or from the circulation. So we created parabiosis mice and we found that connecting young animal to aged animal, age to age is control, young to young is control. To make a long story short, we found that the down regulation of interferon gamma is controlled by the circulation, whereas the up regulation of interferon beta is controlled by signaling coming through the CSF. The next question we ask ourselves, can we rejuvenate the choroid plexus and restore cognitive ability? To rejuvenate the choroid plexus, we decided to inject into the CSF antibody directed to type 1 uh, to interferon beta receptor. We envisioned that the interferon beta, which is produced by, by the epithelial cells, can do uh, autocrine regulation, so it can affect the epithelial cells and can affect the brain. So to neutralize both activity, we injected the antibody directed to interferon beta receptor. 
we found that we restore all the activity of the choroid plexus by neutralizing the interferon beta receptor relative to isotype IgG control, and we reduce gliosis in the age brain. To further test whether it has any effect on cognition, we took a huge cohort of aged mice. We scored the mice first to find out those aged mice that impair, with impaired cognition. As was reported, and the same in human, 30% of the aged mice are still of intact memory. So we took the 70%, split them into two groups. Uh, one received the IgG control, the other received the inter antibody to interferon beta receptor, and we found that this group showed improved cognition almost to the level of their those with intact memory. Since we published this paper, uh, we decided to check whether, whether the signature of the interferon beta, which is produced by the choroid plexus, affect the microglia. So we sorted the microglia from aged brain and from young brain, and indeed we found that the majority of the signature of the microglia in aged uh, mice is type 1 interferon. And intriguingly, among the molecule expressed by the aged microglia, uh, and which affected by the uh, neutralizing the interferon beta receptor is the beta 2M, which was published by Tony Weiss-Curry as cognitive impairing protein, and the C4B, which was published by Beth Stevens and Ben Barris, that impairing cognition. So overall, what we found, the type 1 has a very prominent signature on the microglia, and neutralizing type 1 signature can alleviate some of the symptoms of aging and restore microglia activity. Based on this, uh, we decided to go to Alzheimer with the idea that we, found we already knew that in Alzheimer's we would need macrophages to fight against Alzheimer. We already knew that entry of macrophages to the CNS depend on the choroid plexus epithelium. And we always already knew that we need interferon gamma in order to activate the choroid plexus and interferon gamma is going down with aging. So we decided to see what is the fate of the choroid plexus in aging and whether we can reverse it. So uh, as probably you are familiar with, there are many uh, hallmarks that have already identified in Alzheimer, including amyloid plaques, neurofibrillar tangles. There are several animal models that mimics the disease associated with amyloid plaques. There are already several animal models that mimics the neurofibrillary tangles. There is a local neuroinflammation. As I said at the beginning of my talk, that attempt were made to treat the neuroinflammation with systemic anti-inflammatory drug. Needless to say that any therapy that was directed to A beta plus was turned out not to be disease-modifying therapy. In my belief, it's not because um, A beta plaques are not destructive, but by the time that they are prominent, that there is cognitive decline, removal of the plaque may be efficient, but insufficient. So we decided to focus on, uh, this is just to summarize, the numerous work that was published over the years demonstrating that recruitment of macrophages to the site of pathology can benefit the disease, not only by facilitating removal of plaque, but also changing the milieu of the CNS from pro-inflammatory to less inflammatory. So we decided to focus on two animal of model of Alzheimer, one which is associated with A beta pathology and one which is associated with tau pathology. Now the A beta pathology, there are several models. We decided to focus on the, the one that we, we call the 5X5. There are five human mutations and this was this, uh, developed in uh, Chicago in uh, 2006. This is the only model that simulates almost all the symptoms that know in human in the sense that there is a cognitive loss, there is a beta pathology, and there is also neuronal loss, and there is a local inflammation. So we started with this model, and the first thing that we tested whether the choroid plexus epithelium uh, express trafficking molecules. And we tested all the trafficking molecules that we knew already that are needed 
for recruitment of macrophages. We tested by immunohistochemistry and by mRNA. And the broken lines show you the expression of trafficking molecule by age, where, age match white hat control. And you can see that from two months onward, not only that there is no elevation that you need to facilitate recruitment of macrophages, but it's going down. And the, uh, the major and the most striking uh, down-regulation cytokine was CXCL10, which is interferon gamma-dependent. Based on this, we went to see whether in this mouse model there is reduction in availability of interferon gamma. And we found by flow cytometry and intracellular staining for interferon gamma and by mRNA that there is a striking drop in interferon gamma in this mouse model. We got some human section and we tested the expression of ICAM and we found that in an uh, LC uh, young people, uh, the choroid plexus express high level of ICAM, which is going down with aging and further in Alzheimer. So overall, in this mouse model, we found that there is reduction of trafficking molecule and the reduction in interferon gamma. Uh, uh, subsequent to our work, there was another work using another mouse model of Alzheimer, the J20, and they found exactly the same phenomena, that interferon gamma is going down and ICAM is going down with the disease progression. Now, in principle, uh, we tested to see whether there is any relationship between expression of trafficking molecules and uh, entry of immune cells to the CSF. And in the model of um, a, a stress, which leads to post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, we found a great correlation between expression of trafficking molecules and our ability to detect immune cells, mainly T cell, in the CSF. So in principle, there are several ways to augment level of availability of interferon gamma, which I call them either press the gas or loosen the brakes. So either you can reduce suppression mechanism or activate the immune cells. Now to activate the immune cells, you need either co-stimulatory molecules or active vaccination. So we decided to test whether augmenting availability of interferon gamma could be achieved by blocking suppressive mechanism. Now suppressive mechanism can be regulatory T cell, myeloid suppressor cells, or immune checkpoint, uh, inhibitory immune checkpoint. And we decided because we know that with aging, there is elevation of FOXP3 regulatory T cell. We know that with exhaustion of the immune system, there is elevation of in inhibitory immune checkpoint. We decided to focus on an approach of loosening the gas at the brakes. So what we did, the first thing that we did, we bred the Alzheimer mice with FOXP3 DTR, which we call, got from Rodensky. Uh, thereby, we have now Alzheimer mice that we can deplete selectively regulatory T cell. So we depleted them once from 16 to 0.4. After two, uh, two weeks, the level of regulatory cells rebound. And we tested whether a single session of reducing regulatory T cell will be sufficient to activate the choroid plexus as a gateway and to overcome the disease pathology at least transiently. So we found that a week after the depletion of regulatory T cell, the choroid plexus epithelium was activated both by immunohistochemistry and by mRNA. We further found that months after the depletion of regulatory T cell, we see myeloid cells and regulatory T cell in the brain parenchyma around the plaques. When we check cognitive ability and pathology, we were amazed to see this is the pathology since the, the, in this mouse model, the beta plaques are human plaques, so they are very easy to distinguish. We use antibody directed to human A beta, and I'm, I'm not sure that you can see it with this slide, but you can see it in the hippocampus. This is the hippocampus of the Alzheimer mice the, without the depletion. And this is the depletion, systemic depletion of regulatory T cell. There was a dramatic reduction both in the cortex and the hippocampus. You can see quantification here. We tested cognitive ability by Morris Watermaze, which measured mainly spatial learning and memory. 
So this maze uh, involves three phases, a phase of learning acquisition and a phase, uh, two phases of memory. So uh, during the four days of memory ac learning acquisition, the Alzheimer mice that were not depleted of regulatory T cell didn't learn this are the red. Uh, the black show you the wild type animal and the blue show you the animals that we depleted regulatory T cells. So they went almost to behave as normal mice. Uh, when we remove the platform from the maze, so the animal uh, in, the, in, the, uh, may, in, in the water pool, there is a platform which is very close to the surface of the water. The animal don't see the platform, but there are pictures around the, the water pool. So they can remember to navigate themselves to the platform based on the picture around the pool. So when you remove the platform, we measure the time. It's everything is automatically. We measure the time that the animal spent around the place that they remember them at the platform. So the animal depleted of regulatory T cell remember very similar to the wild type animal, whereas the animals that were not depleted of regulatory T cell didn't remember. And we found also a dramatic reduction in the gliosis. Based on this idea, we realized that we need to record to the Alzheimer brain immunoregulatory T cell, but in order to achieve this, we have to transiently reduce the regulatory T cell to allow availability of interferon gamma producing cells at the choroid plexus. This were for us very much reminiscence of what we know in cancer, and we decided to check whether blocking the immune checkpoint, we can achieve the, the same. Now we decided to focus on PD-1, PD-L1 for the following reason. We knew that the factor memory, both CD4 and CD8 are expressing PD-1. And more importantly, the ligand, the PD-L1, can be expressed by epithelial cells, regulatory T cell, and antigen presenting cells, all of which we have at the choroid plexus epithelium. So we envision that suppressive T cell can, are suppressed either by the regulatory T cell antigen presenting cells and also at the sides of the choroid plexus. So we decided to give the animal either anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 and thereby unleash CD4 positive T cell in addition to the CD8 which are unleash NAR for cancer uh, therapy. We started with anti-PD-1, but I'll show you unpublished data with anti-PD-L1. So uh, the first thing that we did, uh, we gave the animal, this was published a year ago in Nature Medicine, so we gave the animal anti-PD-1 and checked whether the choroid plexus was activated in a, uh, interferon gamma type signaling, and we found that this indeed was the case. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, as control, we use IgG control. These are antibody to ir irrelevant antigen. We checked to see whether the choroid plexus was activated to express trafficking molecule, and we saw that it's activated. And interestingly, when we gave the animal prior to the anti-PD-1, a day before the anti-PD-1 anti-interferon gamma, we block the induced activity of the anti-PD-1, which was verifying for us that indeed it was interferon gamma dependent. We next tested whether as a result of the treatment there is increased recruitment of monocytes derived macrophages, and we found that two weeks after the treatment there was about two-fold increase in the number of monocytes derived macrophages. And again, when we gave the animal anti-interferon gamma prior to the anti-PD-1, we blocked this elevation. Based on this, we decided to move to testing cognitive ability. And in this case, we intentionally use very advanced stage of the disease. In this animal, there is a complete loss of cognition based on the people that developed this model and based on our experience at six months old. So we started at 10 months old and treated the animal at 10 months old with anti-PD-1 and tested them a month later. This is a single injection. In our original paper, we gave two doses at two, a three days interval, 250 microgram and 250 microgram. Subsequently, we repeated and a single injection was sufficient a month later to see cognitive ability. 
Now, it was recommended in these mice, in order not to exhaust them, to use a two-day um, uh, maze. So it's again water pool, but there are six arms in the water pool, and in one arm there is a, a platform. And what you measure, the learning curve of the animal by the number of errors they made before they navigate themselves straight to the arm with the platform. So the Alzheimer mice are shown in red. So over the last two days, they didn't learn and, rem uh, and remember. Uh, the black show you the wild type animal. The gray show you the ones that were treated with the IgG, which we call the placebo. And the green show you the animals that were treated with anti-PD-1. So there was reverse of cognitive loss in this mice. We tested the plaque burden, and you can see here, this animal received uh, two sessions of injection and were analyzed two months after we started the treatment. So animals that received two injections and uh, we tested two months after we started, there was a very nice plaque removal. And uh, the green show you the gliosis, the GFAP, and the red show you the plaque. Whereas the animals that were treated with IgG, you still see a very uh, high burden of plaque and gliosis. So the effect on the histology was very dramatic. Uh, since we published this paper, we decided to repeat and see whether early treatment in this mice model will uh, prevent loss of cognition or delay loss of cognition. So we started to treat the animal at three months, four months, and five months, and tested them at five and six months. And what you can see that at six, five months, the ones that are the control mice are still showing some cognitive ability at the last trial, the last day where at six months, they already lose it. So in the course of this experiment, the control are becoming worse, whereas the ones that treated with anti-PD-1 maintain the ability to learn and remember. Uh, subsequently, we tested to see whether the early treatment is associated with rescue of neurons, which we measure in the subiculum, because that's the place that uh, was recommended in this mouse model to see neuronal survival and uh, CASPER-3 as a measure, again, of apoptosis. And you can see here that the treatment, of course, you don't revive lost neuron, but there is a very nice uh, neuro uh, uh, protection, and there is a dramatic reduction in CASPER-3 ex uh, expressed by the, the neurons. Uh, we decided to test whether anti pdl one will have a similar effect, and you can see a dose-dependent response, uh, um, the 0.1 microgram, uh, 0.1 milligram, there is no effect, 0.5 and 1.5. So the anti pdl one have very similar effect and show very nice dose dependency, and we also show very nice effect on the inflammatory milieu in favor of elevation of IL-10 and reduction of IL-12. Now, importantly, because the treatment is given systemically and not to the brain, we envision that it's not dependent on the type of pathology of the brain, but we are activating a cascade of immune event that starts in the periphery and culminates in the brain. So we decided to check another mouse model of Alzheimer's, which is not A beta driven, and it's tau pathology. So the, in this model, there are two human mutation of uh, a, a microtubule associated protein hyperphosphorylated. And in this mouse model, you test, uh, it's recommended to test short-term memory. So basically, it's a T-maze where the, the animals are habituated first to learn the two arm, and one arm is closed. And after they are habituated to the two arm, you open the third arm, and you measure the time the animals spend in the novel arm. If they don't remember, they will spend equally, uh, equal time in the sore arm. If remember, they will spend more time in the novel than in the two other arms. So you can see it very nicely here. So these are the uh, 
uh, the, this, uh, uh, the tau pathology treated with IgG, and these are treated with anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-1. So, and this is the wild type. So the wild type spend 60% uh, of the time in the novel arm and similarly the treated one. And we found that in this mouse model, again, the treatment is associated with recruitment of monocytes-derived macrophages into the parenchyma, and there is reduction of hyperphosphorylation of tau. So the, the effect of the disease is not dependent on the type of etiology, but on the immune system. Uh, and this is just to show you that we uh, cause a dramatic reduction in the hyperphosphorylation of the two uh, tau mutation. Now, um, we repeated this experiment in a dose-dependent manner, and this shows you very uh, nicely. This is wild-type animal, the time the individual animals spend in the novel arm. This is the IgG control in all arm. They spend the same time. This is low dose in all arm the same time. And if you go higher, you see that animals spend more in the novel arm, both in 0.5 and 1.5. So based on all of this, we ask ourselves, why do we need to recruit macrophages? Why microglia cannot do the job? So I'll fi finish with a very brief story about the microglia. We decided to check what is the fate of the microglia in this disease. Uh, over the years, there were numerous reports on microglia in Alzheimer's. Some claim that they are not effective. Some claims that they are inflammatory. So there were a lot of theory. And we thought that lack of consensus is reflection of not having good markers for microglia. So together with Ido Amit at the Weizmann Institute, we decided to go for single cell RNA sec of the microglia. I know that some of you heard Aviv Regev in the previous talk. So we are collaborating on the neurons, but the microglia we did in collaboration with Ido Amit. And we decided to, uh, to collect single cell RNA at single cell microglia and to do the sequence of the RNA. And what we found that in the mild timer, there is a very small subpopulation of microglia that behave distinctively from the rest of the microglia. They are about 5 to 10 percent. We could not detect them in our, if you do robust RNA sequencing of the microglia, only by single cells we could detect them. We found that based on the markers that they express, they are losing some of the restraining activity of microglia, such as the CXCR1, PY12R, and they are upregulating many genes that have already reported by GWAS that are associated with the disease pathology, such as STREM2 and LPN. So based on the profile, we felt confident that these microglia are associated with activity. When we stand them, we found that they are adjacent to the plaques both in mice and in human. We followed the, the development of this microglia, and we found that they are developing with the disease progression. And then we collaborated for Marco, with Marco Colonna because we found that they are elevating TREM2, and TREM2 is an interim stage. We first saw down regulation of many of the genes that are associated with their homeostasis. Then we found the TREM2. And then we found many other genes. So we wanted to see whether TREM2 is key regulator in their development. So we harvest single cell microglia from wild type animal, TREM2 wild type, TREM2 positive, and TREM2 negative Alzheimer mice. To make a long story short, what we found that the first stage of microglia activation in this mouse model is TREM2 independent. And the last stage is TREM2 dependent. It was shown that the disease is worse in TREM2 knockout mice. And what we are seeing that in TREM2 knockout Alzheimer mice, we don't see this microglia. All of them are stuck in the interim phase. So it means that they are TREM2 negative and TREM2 phases. And TREM2 elevation by microglia orchestrate the development of this disease associated microglia. And we are currently focusing to see what, what, uh, uh, to what extent they are beneficial and whether the treatment is uh, by recruiting macrophages augment their number or change their profile. 
but we have only preliminary data. So overall, I would like to summarize my take home message uh, today. So what we are, we are showing that well control immune activation outside the CNS rather than suppression is needed to combat neurodegenerative disease, regardless of the disease etiology, we found it in A beta and we found it in the tau. Uh, since immune activation is not disease specific, it can potentially be applicable, we opt to wide uh, type of disease. Uh, the choice of activation mo mode, whether stepping on the gas pedal or releasing the brakes, is very much dependent on the disease stage and the type of deficiency. We have uh, this other disease models such as ALS, where we found that this agricole plexus dysfunction, nevertheless, the checkpoint, uh, the inhibitory checkpoint are not sufficient. We are seeing that activation of the systemic immune system facilitate recruitment of macrophages to parenchyma, but we don't know whether the activity is totally dependent on macrophages or the macrophages induce other uh, cells to be more beneficial. The treatment is mechanism driven and microglia are potentially beneficial but their activation require release some of the microglia of signaling that we are furthering studying. This is a, a, a cartoon that was produced for me. Researchers are trying a new approach. When the brain is under threat, it sends a distress signal to the immune system to come to the rescue. But immune cells are too big to get into the brain the normal way. So they have to use a back door. <laughs> As we age, that backdoor entry gets harder. But what if we just give the immune cells a bit of help, a booster? Well, researchers are finding that can have a positive effect on Alzheimer memory loss, at least in mice anyway. Could it work in humans too? So I got this courtesy from the EU for getting uh, the, uh, the competitive advanced ERC for the second time, and I thought that this is nice illustration. So before I'm finalizing, because I spoke a lot about the immune checkpoint blockade, and you know a lot in cancer immune checkpoint blockade, I would like to emphasize that based on the mechanism of action, uh, we don't need to keep exposed the animal and we opt not the patient for continuously for the immune checkpoint blockade. It should be intermittent treatment. We found that months after a single treatment, we still see effect. And the interval is needed in order to allow the entire activity to get. So the treatment will be distinctive of the treatment for cancer, and that's why I'm emphasizing it. So this work was heavily supported by competitive grant by the EU, which we, uh, is called the Advanced ERC, by many other grants from the EU and many other uh, foundation, competitive foundation uh, in Israel and outside Israel. These are graduate students that did, are currently in my lab, they did the work. It's quite international. Uh, all the single cell was done in collaboration with in, indeed outstanding sci young scientists at the Weizmann Institute. Igor Amit, some of the work was done in collaboration with Tony Weiss School from Stanford and other scientists from Israel, Neil Friedman, and from Italy and from Sweden. And these are former graduate students, many of which, uh, or many of whom are now independent professor either in the States or in Israel or in Europe, and without them I couldn't be able to do this work. Thank you. I will be happy to take questions. Hello. Hi, um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm used to seeing like a, a type 1 interferon signature leading to some sort of damage of some kind. Uh, I was wondering how you think uh, this coracoid plexus is preventing any sort of damage while maintaining. I that. think that there is more and more data accumulating that even in MS, any EAE type 1 interferon by itself is not damaging. It may be that overshooting, overdosing can be, 
but even in animal model, EIL, interferon gamma by itself, is not sufficient to drive the disease. Michal, that was a tour de force. Uh, so this might be a naive question, but PD-1 uh, pathway blockade is, is now, uh, has now been performed, as you mentioned, on so many cancer patients. Is there any evidence that they experience cognitive changes? Uh, you're asking a very good question. We contact many centers in Israel and in Europe and in the States that are treating patients with anti-PD-1 or anti pd one First of all, they are treating in a different regimen. Secondly, it was never recommended by the FDA or any clinical trial to test cognitive. So there is no report on this. So the answer is zero. The only thing that they told me that elderly population respond very well to anti pd one and anti pd one for cancer. So it means that they have the potential to respond. But cognitive ability, there is no follow-up. So the question is, uh, is this system of immune protection and surveillance effective in the fetal stage? Because some, uh, it was suggested that infection of the mother could, might cause autism. And so I was thinking in terms of the implications of your observations That's in the mice. Point. Uh, we are currently testing it. That's a very good point. Excellent point. I don't have an answer. The only thing that I have clear answer, we tested a mental dis disability, and we found that in animal model that cause uh, depression or post-traumatic stress disorder, the gate is completely shut off. And if we alleviate from the suppression, we can reduce some of the symptoms of depression. But with respect to pregnancy, we have very preliminary data. We Do know we have some more, we, it's the community has some model of uh, babies' infection during pregnancy, such as the poly IC, but we could not detect any effect on the choroid plexus. The work is exciting. Are you doing any clinical trial soon? Uh, it will. It's beyond my control, but the startup company took it and they signed a big agreement with a European uh, company for translating into the patient. So do you, do you have uh, an idea of how this is going to move to the clinical trials? Do you think it's going to stay systemic, or do you, do you have any plans of making it more specific to the coracoid plexus? Or, uh, or no, you cannot, you cannot monitor in patient, in, in living individual, the choroid plexus. So we are using blood markers to monitor the activity as a measure of the effect on the choroid. There's no way to detect the choroid. In MRI, you can see the signature of the choroid, but the response to, there is no way to measure chemokine. Hi, fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if the, the T cells that afforded the protection, did they get turned into tissue resident T cells or did they, um, did they stay in the periphery? That's a good point, but I don't have answer. We have T cells that sit all the time in the choroid plexus. We know that they are needed for the activation. We see in several paradigms entry of T cells into the parenchyma. But there, I, I, there's no way that I can tell you that the same T cell that sits in the choroid is the one that we see in the parenchyma. Also, we see in all the pathology that we first see effective cells and then regulatory T cell. And we don't know whether it's a local conversion or separate recruitment. So there are many things that we still don't know and or we don't have the tools to follow the cells. And then just one more follow-up that you kind of already touched on. I was going to ask if this protection is transplantable, if you, if you could take the T cells from a protected mouse and transfer them. Uh, we did it long ago. Uh, you can take T cell and transfer it, but you can take any effect of T cell and transfer. If there is nothing unique, there should be memory T cell that their cognitive antigen is being presented at the choroid plexus. But we still don't know whether the T cell that we see the choroid and the parenchyma are the same. There is no, uh, we don't know. What do you think is the mechanism by which cellular entry is restricted 
uh, to the choroid plexus as distinguished from all the other tight junctions in the nervous system. And do the fenestra play any role in this process? Uh, so the difference between the choroid plexus, the other, it's because the only place where it's not endothelial barrier, but the epithelial barrier. Uh, the meninges, uh, you have the, du me the, uh, the dura, the meninges in the dura and in the pier. The dura is different than the meninges. In the pier, it's again endothelial cells tightly connected. The only place where it's not tightly connected are the choroid plexus, where the barrier is made by epithelial cells, and the epithelial cells, cells once it's activated, can pass it. 